Do you remember your sex education? Was it helpful to you? Was it filled with scientific information rather than real, practical advice? I'm Diggory Waite, and this is The Real Sex Education. Each week, I'll be joined by a guest. We'll impart our own sex wisdom, ask our own sex questions, and we'll go over all the things they don't teach you in school. To bring this all together, though, we'll need an expert. A sexpert, if you will. But the only sex and relationship therapist I know is my mum. Hello, mum. Hello, Diggs. In this episode, we're joined by comedian and podcaster Sarah Keyworth. I'm delighted to be here at this little family gathering. We talk about how Sarah navigated teenage school life. Just don't talk about sex and then nobody will spot that you're a tiny lesbian. Her experiments with tampons. Whoa, that is absorbent. And confusing representations of lesbians on TV. And then I watched it and was like, this is not what I am prepared for. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Real Sex Education. I'm Diggory Waite and as ever I'm joined by accredited sex and relationship therapist Kate Campbell. Hello Mum. Hello Diggs. How are you doing today Mum? Great, thank you Diggs. How are you? I'm very good as well because in this podcast Mum and I give sex and relationships a good going over with a fantastic guest and this week is no different. We are so happy to welcome comedian and podcaster Sarah Keyworth to the show. It's another belter of an interview isn't it Mum? It certainly is. It's great. Excellent. Well, a cracking interview with Sarah Keyworth isn't all you've got to look forward to, listeners. Oh, no, no. At the end of the show, we open up our mailbox to listeners like yourselves to ask Kate, a real sex and relationship therapist, anything you like. You can send in your queries to podcasts at hattrick.com, that's hattrick with two Ts, or on Twitter via the hashtag RealSexEdu, that's RealSexEDU. Come on, guys, it's your chance for free therapy. Or if you don't want free therapy, you can send in emails like this one, which say, hi, Diggory, love, love the podcast. Um, I looked you up on Instagram and you're really good looking. I think you're attractive and strong. What? what who wrote from- this? Um, Who is this? Lauren, 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 yes. Lauren. Mum, we, we've got to get on with the interview. The people oh. don't want to get waiting. So today yeah. we speak to Sarah Keyworth about her sex education. And I began by asking her how she was doing today. I'm great. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here at this little family gathering. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> Yeah, you, I mean, Very nice. slight imposter, but we'll mm-hmm. pretend that you're one of the gang, one of the yeah, fam. Yeah, like a third cousin or something. Yeah. So, are you excited to talk about your sex education, even in this oh, yeah. family setting? Can't wait. Can't <laughs> wait. Excellent. Um, we had your girlfriend, Catherine Bohart, on the show a couple of weeks ago. What has she told you about the show? She put the fear of God in you or... Oh, no, she immediately came out and went, I think we need to book an appointment with Kate, so... Um... <laughs> really? Oh, my God. Um... Okay, well then, why don't we get just straight straight just into it? it. Yeah, um, I always ask this question: How was your sex education? Uh, I, th- I, th- I mean, I think it was probably awful. Yeah. Um, especially given that I'm gay, and they didn't do much gay coverage. No. I mean, they didn't do any gay coverage at all. Mm. Um, it, it was a lot of the sort of standard things that you hear about, like a, a tampon in a water glass and a condom on a banana. Um, What's the tampon in a water glass? That's passed me by. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's because they made the boys <laughs> leave the room. Don't laugh about that. I'm trying to learn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they made, it, it was in uh, primary school, so it's like year six. Yeah. And I guess it's it's the, the beginnings of what they were calling sex education, but it was more sort of about like your uh, reproductive health in terms of having periods and stuff. Yeah. But they made all the boys leave the room. Unhelpful. That's exactly why I don't know about this. Yeah, yeah. and then they told all the girls about um, sanitary towels and mm. tampons and all sorts of uh, very exciting things. And mm. what part of it, I guess, to show us what would happen when a tampon is covered in, in blood mm. uh, and how absorbent it is, mm. uh, they put a tampon in a water glass and we all went, Whoa! <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> that like... is absorbent. You're right. They were telling the truth. It's um, like one of those magic trees, isn't it? Just, just expands yeah, just and, bl- and grows into this yeah. beautiful mm. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But we're all sat there, like, 
I don't really know why the boys couldn't see this, mm. you know? Yeah, that is bizarre. And like I say, now I'm yeah. the one who is missing out. And that's why I asked the question, like, what's going on here? I feel like... You're going to leave this and just immediately put a tampon and a water glass on I, you. Absolutely. If I can get my hands on one at this family <laughs> gathering, I feel like I won't be able to find it very easily. But... Steal a tampon <laughs> yeah. out of a relative's bag. <laughs> exactly. Brilliant. Well, so what, that was early doors. What about, like, secondary school-ish? Any, any, anything better? Mm. Still nothing on the gay agenda, I imagine. That was no, probably, nothing yeah. on the gay agenda. And I feel like the majority of the sex education I can remember wasn't at secondary school. Right. I mean, the lasting memory was the awkward lesson with the condoms. Mm. And it's all the boys in the class, like, pretending, like, like nicking the condoms, like, putting them in their pockets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, we're 12. Yeah. Chill out, man. But, like, <laughs> yeah. I, one of my horrific memories from sex education in primary school was that I was ill and missed a lesson and there was a video that the whole class had watched and I'd missed it and for some reason the teacher said to my mom take the video home Mm. and Sarah can watch it at home and then my mom insisted on watching it with me which was just the most distressing thing how old were you at this point well that would have been sort of like 10 11 oh dear and it was that classic video of the the man and the woman just randomly walking naked around their house. We we hear about this a lot. Yeah. I never got this like naked man and woman walking around. I, I really? that feel, yeah, like like naturists just sort of going about their business yeah. rather than and it's sort of slow mo and then it like it freezes and it and all the sort of like infographic text pops up about yeah. like this is the man's willy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the not the woman's willy. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> the feelings you said it was awful watching it with your mum. Describe that to me what what you know why you, can you think now why she insisted to watch it with you do you I don't, I don't know you maybe she was just further? yeah maybe and maybe the just the idea of like a child alone watching that video is mm. quite creepy isn't it like yeah i suppose actually yeah that i does. remember desperately wanting to just watch it alone because like i was like fine i have to watch it because it's been sent home with me mm. so homework there is no need for us to to do this together mm. but my mum was like no i'm sitting with you <laughs> Yeah. And maybe she just wanted to see what it was like, like what it actually was going to be. Like I, I reckon that was just intrigue disguised as careful parenting. Mm. I think she was like, "God, I want to fucking see this." Oh, she wanted to answer your questions. She wanted maybe. to help. You. I didn't have any questions for her, Kate. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> no. The video stopped, and I was like, "Thank you. No okay. further questions." <laughs> the defence rests. Yeah. <laughs> but so is there just before we move on from school is there something you wish that you'd that that, that they told you earlier on or if if you could take over the curriculum would you be like this is what i'd teach you guys this is what i could have done with there's a lot of like fear mongering with school education isn't Mm. there it's a lot of you don't have to do this and just say no if you're not ready which is obviously great but then there's like also this whole narrative of like it must be special and it must be Mm. meaningful and it must be with someone you're in love with Which is, I think that almost, you have to unlearn the weight of sex Mm. when you turn into an adult. You have to be like, oh, actually, I can enjoy this with somebody without attaching all of these complicated feelings and, like, having sex and thinking, oh, God, we're going to have such a great life together. Mm. But it's like, you can actually just say thank you very much that was very nice and see them awkwardly on the comedy circuit for the rest of your life <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but that's good a more you know sex positive approach to sex education yeah just sex chill like looking back in my memory that you can tell that like even the teachers are like you've got to be with somebody you're in love with like you can see in his eyes that he's like (laughs) this isn't true like they've all had lived experiences presumably they've all been having sex and probably had casual sex and Mm. yet they walk into this classroom and they're like you've got to find the one and then you give them the keys to your body it doesn't have to be that scary no so you redo the curriculum and you you say that sort of thing you're like we can have sex for fun yeah I don't know if I would stay doing the <laughs> curriculum for long. Yeah. I think I'd be one lesson in and I'd be like, fuck everyone! And they'd be like, maybe we're taking you out of this. Yeah, also uh, it's like, you know, a grown person comes in and it's like, hey everyone, 
all you little kiddies out there, sex can be fun for you guys. I mean, like you say, the curriculum, uh, yeah, might not last that long. No, but you've got a point. They could be saying there are different kinds of relationships. Some of them are serious, some of them are less serious. I mean, mm-hmm. just just that, that would do. That would cover mm. it. And just when you're a bit older, like if, mm. if, if they were doing these lessons when you were like in year 11, 15, 16, yeah. and they were like, we were frightening you back then. It's a bit like uh, Santa Claus. Maybe we weren't as truthful as mm-hmm. we should have been. Yeah. But we were just trying to manipulate you into going to bed on time. Yeah. And then at that stage, they can be like, now that you're afraid, we're going to relieve some of your fears and that you, you can actually have sex. That doesn't mean that you have to marry that person. And in a sick and very twisted way, that's actually quite clever. Because like you say, then if you're working back from fear into... You then have that base level of fear mm-hmm. that's quite helpful to have. <laughs> and yeah. can put, probably keep you safe and, in, and put you in some good stead. And then you can work your way back. Yeah, because you can't deny that sex leads to maybe unplanned pregnancies and teenagers or yeah. young people and uh, STIs and things like that. So you need to scare them a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's my curriculum, actually. And that means that <laughs> yeah, you're actually yeah. free to go harder on the, on the terror. Yeah. You could almost lie <laughs> yeah. and say some really frightening things. Yeah. Go. And then dial back. I am, I just, I do fear the Twitter storm, though, when people go, yeah, my child, I sent them to this curriculum school. They were essentially educationally beaten and then educationally stroked back into... And well, it's just... you know, given that we have such a, a controlled state... At this hypothetical school, yes. I, I probably can stop them going on Twitter at the start. You That's know, a good point. Continue the lies, <laughs> yeah. extend the fear exactly. for full media <laughs> lockdown, you know? So what about your friends at school and stuff? Were you talking about sex with them? What was going on there? I mean, there's a lot of repression going on in my brain, I think, when I was, <laughs> when I was a child. Because yeah. it was like, just don't talk about sex and then mm. nobody will spot that you're a tiny lesbian. <laughs> Um, I would be sort of like sex adjacent in terms of conversations. I would like hear Mm. other friends talking about guys and I would just be like... (laughs) Did you, Sarah, when you were at school, did you ever play that game where you think of some people and then you give them numbers and then your friend says, which number would you kiss? Which number would you this? Which number would you that? And then you have to... Oh, it's like snog, marry, avoid. Yes, that sort of thing, yeah. We definitely played like... The, the marry and the avoid version, because that, mm. that was PC for me. I could cope with that. Yeah, right. Yeah, you, you <laughs> and you can, can marry and avoid and, and still be a closet lesbian, you know? Yeah. yeah. They yeah. can be a beard. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you talk a bit more about that and what that was like in you discovering your sexuality? Because like we've discussed already, you know, you said your sex education early doors was very heteronormative. So when you're a little lesbian, mm-hmm. <laughs> as you say, like, what, what was that like? How was... I mean, it was really... Yeah confusing and I think I had a lot of internalized homophobia mm. in terms of you know you have that sort of classic thing of, of somebody being like how do lesbians actually have sex like I think mm. I, I didn't know the answer to that because mm. like a lot of the television I'm thinking like skins yeah it wasn't actually particularly hetero focused but it, mm. it was like very sexual and I remember watching and sort of waiting for a, like a queer storyline with two women, like almost being like, okay, yeah, but somebody just like show me what's going on. Yeah. And then I watched a TV show called Sugar Rush, mm. which I found at the age that I was, was kind of a bit much. Right. What age was that? I think I must have been sort of 12 or 13. Right. And it, when, it, when it came out and I, and I was... Actually a bit shocked. I think, yeah, and I think I tried to watch it and it was like one of the first scenes was like her using her electric toothbrush as a vibrator. Classic. And then like I think one of the characters like worked in a sex shop in Brighton so there was all these massive sex toys and like dildos and vibrators and all these sorts of things and I was just like I found it a bit... And the, th- the fact is I, I don't think a 12-year-old lesbian was the target audience <laughs> but I it was one of the only things I, I'd found that was portraying sexual lesbian relationships Mm, mm. and so I was like I need to watch that and then I watched it and was like this is not what I am prepared for (laughs) (laughs) 
feels like we've missed a few steps here. I feel mm. like there's definitely got to be some gaps between being a 12-year-old virgin to wearing a massive purple strap on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> there's something in between that. There yeah. has to be a middle ground. Surely. It keeps it keeps coming up, though. If you watch anything with sex in it, it comes up. It says, do you, you watch this? It's full on. It, like, when people mention it, it kind of fills me with, like, a, a bit of anxiety because everyone's like, oh, I love that. Like, Catherine used to watch it. Catherine's five years older than me. She's like, I love that show. And I'm like, that show stressed me out. Well, if it keeps coming up and, you know, everyone's seen it like your girlfriend and stuff, then I've got to check it out. Research. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Not in a weird way. Oh, for God's sake, right. It was the way you said research. (laughs) The hands are here. What the fuck? (laughs) Sexy TV show, eh? If everyone's seen it from Catherine Bohart to Sarah Keyworth, then tonight I'm watching this sexy TV show in the name of research. She's watching sexy TV for science. He was really preferred not to have it, but of course he must, he must for science. You know, not everyone's seen it and you don't have to watch it, right? Weren't you listening? I'm not watching it for me. I'm watching it for science. Do you ever see any of those mates from school anymore? I met up with a group of school friends a couple of years ago and there's a guy I went to school with and it's that classic case of, like, we were mates at school but Mm. we're very different people now. Mm. And he made some comment. I think we were playing, like, a drinking game or something and he made some comment about how, like, lesbian sex is not real sex Mm. and I just remember being like oh I feel really sad for you Mm. it it just made his sex life sound really vanilla I was just like (laughs) does that mean that you you don't really explore very much because you're like this is the thing that's real sex that's Mm. that's the really good lover Feel sorry for your girlfriend. Yeah. Mm, indeed. But it's a thing, isn't it? I mean, it's so everything is everything is focused on the bloody penis and mm-hmm. where you stick it. I mean, that's all anybody thinks about. And it's just... Uh. Well, that was my big question once that I realised is I, I suddenly went, OK, well, if this is what we think... I mean, this is a podcast in itself. What is virginity? But, like, obviously losing your virginity is the whole, like, penis and vaginas thing. So it's like, well, mm-hmm. what if you're a lesbian couple? When do you lose your virginity? There's like a whole conversation that needs to be like changed around the idea yes. and the idea of what sex is, you know? Well, no, but mm. virginity is a social construct. It doesn't really exist. It isn't anything. Exactly. But yet still a lot of people talk about it. And, you know, there's still that like mad rush to get it done before college and all that sort of thing. You know, it still is a it's still a big deal. You're right. Yeah. It's a social construct. But that doesn't mean that we should just disregard it because people take it very seriously. No, 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 no. But the first time you do anything new, it's a big deal, isn't it? I mean, an awful lot mm. of people come for sex therapy and they say, oh, we haven't had sex. And you talk to them and they bloody have. They've had loads and loads of sex. And they And don't know. they just haven't put a penis in a vagina. And so they say mm. they haven't had sex. And if they're avoiding it because they're waiting till they're married, they're really upset when I say, well, you have had sex. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, how are you defining sex then? Anything, any time you touch somebody with intent to be either sexual or intimate to mm. someone of, that you fancy, is sex, isn't it? If you flirt with them, it's sex. But, I mean, mm. going a bit further, any touching, any arousal, it's bloody sex, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, an awful lot of people are having sex, you know, dry humping and things like that and climaxing and the whole shebang and still saying they're not having sex. And it, that seems jolly sexual to me. I think that's right, isn't it? It's sexual. It's like, it's like when, you know, second base and beyond. Second I think base. you can sort of count that as, like, that's a sexual encounter. That's the, the. I think that's the narrative and it's almost the same thing as, like, saving full sex for marriage or whatever. Mm, mm, It's that thing that teenagers do where they're like, oh, no, I haven't done it. I haven't actually done it. It's like, (laughs) well, you've started having sexual relations. Sorry to sound like a president of the United States, but you have started (laughs) having sexual relations with that person. Yeah, yeah. So, Sarah, we have a sex therapist here. If you ever did have any problems, do you reckon you'd consider going to one? Yes, I think so. I think I'm. I'm not very. Uh, <laughs> I'm not very good at going to therapy, uh, and I'm trying to kind of get better at seeing that as like a logical solution, as mm. you would if you broke your arm, you'd mm. go and get it yeah. sorted out. Like I, I'm trying to get better at seeing it as like an actual 
solution or all the, the beginnings of solution mm-hmm. but that is something that I'm sort of learning in time but, but you uh, know there's the shame about that too I mean there's an expectation that you don't do it until you've got a problem and actually you don't have to wait for things to get really really bad and so mm-hmm. people often rock up one with the shame about their bodies two with the shame about their their sexual feelings three with their shame about seeing a therapist so there's an awful lot of shame around which mm-hmm. is you know what I found out like two years ago what? My grandmother was a sex therapist. No, no way. Brilliant. absolutely no. I didn't know. I had no wow. idea. Wow, that's so cool. And she she died about fifteen years ago. Wow. Yeah. I had no idea. I had no idea what she did for a job. And you know, you're <sighs> just like, oh, I just thought she was a grandma. Like, yeah, it was just yeah. terrible. But like, I was like fourteen when she died. Mm. And then I met her with a cousin, and she men- mentioned it casually, and mm. I was like. That's changed my whole yeah. perception of world. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. Must have been, sex therapy must have been very different back in, in her day, I imagine, as well. Yeah, I think they called it like a, a relationship specialist mm. rather than a sex therapist. Mm. But wow. uh, I know what she was doing. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know yeah. what she was up to. Actually, that is just a, just a quick question for you, Mum. I'm I actually genuinely interested. How much do you reckon sex therapy has changed in like the like ideas and theories and things in that, let's say, fifteen years? Well, no, there are different sorts of sex therapists. I mean, sex therapy is sort of broadening, I suppose. So there are people who just work with sexuality and identity and that sort of thing, mm-hmm. and other people who are very pro-sex and know a lot of sexual stuff who are quite good to know if you're trying to find things out and explore your own Mm. development. And then there are the sort, the sort of Masters and Johnson going right the way back sort, that deal with couples particularly, but everybody, Mm. but couples in particular, and actual issues that they have between Mm. them. So an actual problem like not being able to have an orgasm or not being able to get an erection or something like that. So I'm that sort. Mm. And they really, I wouldn't have said that they've changed that much. I mean, I think, really? that, yeah, I think interventions and techniques and things have changed quite a lot. So, I mean, the way I do it isn't necessarily the way I was taught to do it mm. originally. And now, you know, recently I've been teaching people too and writing about it. So I'm part of that movement, I suppose. Mm. But yeah, Masters and Johnson came up with the very first sex therapy, which is based on CBT. And a lot of us are still using that as the basic model. And Masters and Johnson being two two scientists. Two, right? two. Well, he was a, he was a doctor, and she was his secretary, and they had an affair. They had sex, and they used to wire people up in a lab and see how they responded to sexy things happening to them. Yeah, and they had an amazing, <laughs> huge. They had an amazing, huge phallus thing dildo thing i mean that was sort of glass and could film inside the vagina wow did it have night vision it it had a light inside it yeah okay good a little camera i actually saw it which was very exciting recently steady mum so sarah we like to ask at the end of our episodes we like to ask our guests how was it for you what have you learned and what are you taking away if anything um I mean, I think it kind of was like having sex. I feel a bit stressed. <laughs> yeah. I feel like maybe I've done something I shouldn't have done. Mm. But I've, I've, I've had a good time. <laughs> That's good. That's yeah. good, at least in the moment. It was and, fun. Uh, it's not often that I do it with a mother and son. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I, 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 at first, I was very much enjoying this analogy. <laughs> now I'm really, really so, vehemently so against it. Come, uh, uh, people must make that joke quite often. Do you know what? Funnily enough. Oh, God, I know. The, people yeah. are nicer than me. Yeah, I'm so yeah, sorry. You're, you're the first. Yeah, I'm so, I apologise. Um, <laughs> I think that's a lovely a lovely way to put it. But mm-hmm. um, is there anything we can do to maybe, as those, like, we've had a good time, but those f- fears are, are getting bigger. Is there anything we can do to, you know, dampen them down? Just oh, no, don't, don't worry. It? I'll just go and take a shower. It's fine. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and scrub yourself clean. Scrub the shame away. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, just do what I usually do. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks Thanks for having me. Yeah. Nice to meet you. You'll be hearing from me, Kate. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Can't wait. It's the mailbag. Send Kate your queries to podcast at hatch.com. It's the mailbag. Send Kate your queries. Podcast at hatch. with two C's. Hello there. I have a query for Kate. I would like to know when the real sex education mailbag starts. The real sex education mailbag starts right now. Thank you.
Thank you so much to Sarah Keyworth. What a brilliant, brilliant guest. Now is the time of the show we open up our mailbox and answer the questions you've put to mum so you can get an accredited sex and relationship therapist's take on things. You can send in a query to Kate by emailing podcasts at hatchet.com or using the hashtag RealSexEdu. First up is from Mary and Mary says, My partner snores and I'm just not getting any sleep. I have started to go in the spare room but this really upsets him and he says it's insulting. It isn't even that much help as I can still hear him through the wall. He won't go to the doctor about the snoring as he says they have more important things to worry about at the moment. I'm at my wit's end. Oh dear. Well, you should definitely go to the doctor because there are all sorts of conditions that um, that, that snoring is a symptom of, including sleep apnea, which is mm. to be taken seriously. But going in a separate room it shouldn't be a terrible thing if you have to do it. And a lot of people do. And you, you can actually make that quite sexy. So, you know, if you're inviting somebody into your into your boudoir, um, mm. you can have little visits and things. And a lot of couples have a cuddle in bed before they separate and go into their separate rooms. So there's no reason why that has to be um, you know, a problem. I don't, I mean, from the sound of what Mary's saying, though, it doesn't sound like this guy's going to take very kindly to that. Well, she's not taking very kindly to his snoring. So I guess there's mm. an accommodation to be made, isn't there? There's a compromise and meet in the middle. You know, if, if he wants her back. <laughs> wants her back. She's left. She le- oh, yeah, she has left. She's, she's going to another if room. If he wants her back from the other room. <laughs> yeah. And but she's got to go to the doctors, hasn't he? He's they? got to go to the doctors. I mean, you know, doctors are seeing people. They want you to go. So, And now's the time to do it. I once was in Brighton with a group of friends and I, I shared a room one evening with one girl Ooh, and I remember the next yeah. day she was in an awful mood and she was treating me like rubbish and then the rumour got back round to me that Diggory snores and mm. it was the worst night of her life. Um, but I think my snoring's better now. Yeah, I, the, the, I've heard you snore and it goes and you go... Ah. Oh, God. They're really cute little snores. That sounds... No, I'm meant to be cool and strong and... No, like, you're... Ah. You know, oh, for f- don't... Ah. Like that. All right, next up is from someone who wants to keep their true identity hidden, and they ask, As I enjoy bareback sex and my regular partner doesn't, I have been going on Grindr to meet people who satisfy this need in me. I haven't hidden this from my partner, but I haven't been talking to him about it either. Now he has found out he is really upset. I've tried telling him that it's not unusual, and I wouldn't mind if he did it, but he's not upset about the sex. Just what he says is a risk. Because of our circumstances, I don't feel this is risky but it's damaging our relationship. Certainly sounds like it. Keeping secrets is difficult, isn't it, at the best of times? Mm. But I wonder what he means by their circumstances, whether they're HIV negative or positive, and he thinks that that means that either he he's safe or he's only having sex with people who've got the same status, or is he taking... that there's a, there's a drug which helps to stop you from getting... HIV. I mean, the the thing about bareback sex is that you are more likely to pick up a, a sexually transmitted infection. Bareback means without a condom, mm. and you're you're more likely to pick up um, an infection. And I guess that's what his partner is concerned about, mm. and it is mm. concerning, especially if the if if they're. I mean, it sounds like they're happy having multiple partners but I mean the more partners you have sex with the more risk is you're yeah. going to have but but you know a, an awful lot of people an awful lot of people do do this and I guess he thinks well I'm one of many and I'm meeting my needs but I think as far as the relationship's concerned you've got one partner who's not happy about it and mm. so some things they need some help with this I mean there may be a compromise assuming that it is the the bareback element that he's concerned about and not the having other partners that he's concerned about and it doesn't sound yeah. as though that's it i yeah from what i can glean from the email it doesn't seem like that's no. the issue just just the bareback just the thing bareback and, and the and the safety, mm, yeah. and the safety. Which, is, which is a completely completely valid mm. concern mm. and you know maybe that might be a deal breaker but, but i also think that if you're in the in in the kind of culture where a lot of people are doing this which the other partner who's doing it possibly is, it probably doesn't feel that weird. And this is the problem, that they're coming from two different worlds, perhaps, and it is, which is often the case with couples. And, and, but, but the secrecy is, is another element as well, because I think he, he knows, doesn't he, that it, his partner wouldn't have been happy about this. So he hasn't, he, he's, mm. he's, he's taken an, a, a don't ask, don't tell kind of policy. <laughs> 
That's it, isn't that's it? I think problem. that's really interesting. Yeah, it's like, yeah. why weren't you telling them in the first place? Because mm. you knew they weren't going to be happy with it and they're not. Mm. So that's, that is very interesting. Mm. Mm. Maybe that's something we need to all ask ourselves when we're keeping secrets. Mm. Um, Back to the well, ethical slut, I think. So mm. I, I'm trying to think of what's the final word on that. I mean, uh, the, I guess, you know, what, what what's their solution? You know, one partner wants to have bareback sex with and will look elsewhere to get it. The other partner doesn't want to have it and doesn't mind them having sex with other people, but doesn't want them doing it without a condom. So actually, this needs a serious conversation to deal with the lack of openness and honesty and Mm. also to deal with the actual issue of safety. Mm. Brilliant. Well, that is what we have time for. Thank you so much to Sarah Keyworth for taking the time to speak to us. Thank you to our resident sexpert, Kate Campbell. Thanks, Mum. Thanks, Diggs. And thank you for listening. We will catch you next week for another dose of real sex education. Goodbye. Bye. You've been listening to The Real Sex Education, which is hosted by Diggory Waite and Kate Campbell. The show is produced by Andy Goddard and Diggory Waite. The Real Sex Education is a Hattrick podcast. If you'd like to hear more podcasts by Hattrick, including Time Ghost with Alexander Armstrong and Ben Miller, just search Hattrick Podcasts on your podcast provider of choice. This podcast is based on the real-life relationship between Diggory Waite and his mother, registered sex therapist Kate Campbell. The show is therefore inspired by, but otherwise unrelated to, the TV show Sex Education. But, yes, Diggory does wish his co-host was Gillian Anderson. 